So hello there. It's a beautiful sunny day here in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. And I've been thinking a lot about some recordings that I did over the summer. Uh, that was two summers ago already. So here's the story. Basically, I started recruiting stories from women who had had home births or unassisted births. And then I realized, holy moly, there's a whole bunch of us out here who are really strong women in our own right. But we might have had more traumatic or difficult births. And so I put a call out and I now have a grand total of 40 interviews from 40 strong women, good women, maybe not so strong women, whatever women who've had truly remarkably traumatic birth experiences for their children. And for the most part, their children are fine. Some children didn't make it. Children grow up, you know. They grow up well, or they don't, or they do well, or they don't, or contrary to what Monsieur Odon believes, I don't actually believe that children born by C-section or in another difficult way are necessarily going to turn out to be psychopaths. But the mother is wounded. That's the thing. The mother is wounded, and she needs to heal from those wounds. Wounds aren't bad. They hurt. They scar over. You have scar tissue, and then, and then you heal, and you, you go on to do a life. Some of these stories are disturbing. The story that we are about to listen to is disturbing, but it's a real story, and the woman that told that story is a real woman. So I'd love for you to listen. Please reach out if you want to tell your story. Reach out if you have comments. Reach out if you have questions. I love to hear real stories from real women, and I love to see the power behind the wounds the power behind what we do with stuff that happened to us, how we can absorb it, figure it out, and then, for the most part, let it go. So on this bright, lovely, sunny evening, I present to you our first birth story of this series. So grab a box of tissues, have a look at the bright blue sky, and listen up. Spread the love. So basically, I started out um, just wanting to write an article because um, I noticed you're in the U.S., right? Mm -hmm. So here in Canada, um, during the COVID, well, during the lockdown, obviously, we're still in the crisis. But when it just first started, um, women were not being allowed to bring anyone into the hospital. So a lot of women, which I like, I already knew that there was a pretty big unassisted birth movement but a lot more women were going to unassisted and trying to find a lay midwife and, and things like that so right I wanted to write an article about the women that I knew over the years that had done unassisted or lay midwife home births and then I thought well I know tons of really strong women have also had tra traumatic births so why don't I write an article about that too you know right. there's no reason just to praise the ones that have had unassisted births so then I started writing I started thinking about that. Now I have 40 women that I'm interviewing. So I'm definitely going to write an article, but I think I might make a short film as well using people's voices. And if, if you agree the, uh, you know, the, the images, because it's such an important issue, no one's talking about it. So right. that's where it's, yeah. it's kind of growing. It's true. It's very true. Yeah. Um, well, I'm in North Carolina. Um, I, I'm originally from California where home birth is legal and my sister and my mom all had home births. And so in North Carolina, when I moved here and ended up pregnant with my son, my husband and I were like, yeah, naturally we're going to have a home birth. So we planned for a home birth. We got a midwife, but midwife, midwifery in North Carolina is considered illegal. Right. So if you're a midwife in North Carolina and you're not a nurse practitioner or a CNM, you cannot, or not, or not, yeah, CNM, is that right? Yes. You cannot perform home births. So our midwife is a, she's a, not a CNM. She's a, BPM. Um, yep. Yeah. And she's awesome. She was great. She's 
been to school. She passed her test. She's a very educated girl. Um, and we picked her and she's, you know, we had all our stuff ready. We, I had a really healthy pregnancy. I, you know, was super healthy, super, nothing was going wrong. Everything was great. I ended up going up to like 42 weeks pregnant. So I was pretty pregnant with my son and my midwife was like, all right, well, let's get things going. Like, let's try castor oil. So she gave me like a castor oil mixture and I drank that and I was taking some herbs. I, I'm an, I do a lot of herbology stuff. Okay. And so I was just doing everything I could to get things going, you know? And, um, so I started to like, kind of feel like I was going into labor and then start stuff started to pick up. Uh, it, this was like maybe 12 hours later in the middle of the night. So I woke up, I called my midwife, told her, she said, all right, hold off. We'll, keep in touch you know we'll see you around whenever so things started to really pick up and I started to feel like I was in pretty active labor or early early onset labor you know and then she came around three sorry if I like seem like I'm pausing a lot it's because I have to like really remember yeah for sure story for sure yeah <laughs> um but she came around three o'clock or so and we at that point, I was in pretty active labor, my husband says. I, I don't really remember whether or not I was, but I was trying everything. I was in the tub. I was in the shower. I was walking around. It was nighttime, so we had a lot going on, um, and she was there, and so was her assistant midwife and my doula, and we were doing great. Everything was great. We were just going through it, you know, mm -hmm. and um, so then we were, that was like, I was in labor for three days. So I don't really remember at what point we, at one point I had my chiropractor come because I was like, I don't know, something doesn't feel right. I don't feel like he's moving down. And so my chiropractor came and tried to like do some adjustments on me to see if that helped. Um, my midwife broke my water once because she was like, I don't know, like, I think maybe this will help. Yeah. So my bag of water broke twice, which was crazy. I had like a couple bags of water going on. And then what else happened? We were just trying everything. I had taken more herbs. I was drinking lots of water. I was trying to keep stuff down. I was kind of nauseous. Um, but I was in full-blown active labor at that point. And finally, the third day, after two whole days of trying to get things really going, she had checked me and I was at six centimeters and nothing had really progressed. And we were all just kind of running out of ideas of what we could do other than what we were doing and I was getting really tired and I couldn't eat anything and I couldn't drink anything so I was just like in a lot of pain I was having a lot of back labor and so finally I was like I'm calling it and I didn't want to go to the hospital I'm so so against going to the hospital at this point especially where I am in in North Carolina where I know that I'm going to get treated like shit because but where are I'm, you exactly in North Carolina? I was in Charlotte. Now I'm in Black Mountain, but I was in Charlotte, North okay. Carolina. Cuz I know someone in is Richmond. Oh, that's in Virginia. No, she's in North Carolina. Cuz okay, she's Dula, so. that's why I'm anyway. I don't know my geography well enough, so. No worries. Yeah, there's <laughs> a lot of places with the same name, so it could yeah. be I'm kind of new. I've only been here 2 years, so we were in Charlotte for a year and that's where our son was born. And, okay. um, it's a very conservative place. Um, that's where I mean, they I had that demonstration last year. Right? I wouldn't say it's super conservative, but it's definitely it leans more toward like the bankers. There's a lot of bankers there. Okay. There's a lot of money. Um, they don't like, they don't think that home birth is cool. They think you're like a low life that has tattoos oh. and is a drug addict, you know, like, oh, wow. okay. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, so I went to the hospital um, against everything that I believed, but I felt like I felt like something was not right, and, like, I was exhausted, and I was like, I'm done, like, I, I'm tapping out, you know, and it was the hardest decision of my life, but I had to go, so we went, and my midwife had to pretend like she was my doula, because yeah. she can't come out and yeah. say that she's my midwife, and, like, the all the paperwork from my labs, and all the paperwork from my everything that had her name on it with my lab reports and my birth, all my history, she couldn't show them. Yeah. So they thought that I was just an unprepared idiot with no, with no prenatal care. They were like, Oh, you don't have any prenatal care. 
you're a drug addict. So they treated me as such. They treated me terribly. I went into triage and the nurse that was checking me in stuck her hand so far up my vagina that she like made me jump up into the bed. And my husband was like, hey, can you back off? You do not need to do that. And I was like, that like it like hurt me. Like I'm like, that was not okay. And then on top of that, they just like treated us terribly. My husband is Mind you, like, my husband makes good money. He has a good job. We are, like, educated people. We're, like, not, not that that should matter, but, like, we're, like, yeah. not, like, some kids from the street, you know? We're, like, we have a, we have a nice home. We are, like, and we work in the community. We're, like, good people. And they treated us terribly. So I can only imagine what it would be like for somebody who is from the streets going to the hospital and getting treated like shit. And so that, on top of everything, and then, like, throw in if you're a woman of color, like, screw it, they're going to treat you even worse, you know? So I was shocked that that level of treatment that I got from the the people at the hospital that are supposed to help me and who are supposed to make this day about me and my baby versus them and their fucking time. So yeah, so I got in to triage. They treated me terribly, (laughs) like right from the get go. And I was already like, what the fuck are we doing here? Why are we here? (sighs) <sighs> but then, so then they gave me an epidural. They wouldn't give me Pitocin, which I don't understand about. I'm not sure why they wouldn't give me Pitocin. It would make more sense if they had given me Pitocin because I wasn't dilating. Yeah. So they didn't give me Pitocin. They just gave me an epidural, which slowed things down even more and also caused Vito's heartbeat to slow down because that's what an epidural does. <laughs> you know, like you're yeah. laying down, you're on one side, you're hooked up to all these monitors so naturally his heartbeat is going to slow down slight a little bit, but he wasn't in distress. He was perfectly fine. He was healthy. He was perfectly fine. Everything was fine. They just didn't want me there and they didn't want me to waste any more of their resources and they didn't want me to waste any more of their time. So I had my OB after another 12 hours or so. I lied about when my water broke. I said it just broke because I knew yeah. that that was going to be a timeline for them. And so my OB at the time, or he's, he wasn't my OB, the OB that I was assigned came into the room and he said, so yeah, I see that you um, aren't progressing. You're at six centimeters. Um, you're 42 weeks pregnant. We need to get this baby out. And I was like, well, I don't want to have a C-section. I, I'm here to have my baby. Baby, it's okay, bud. I'm here to have my baby and I'm not going to get cut open. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that. And um, he said, well, these are your options. You can either leave here with a healthy baby, a damaged baby, or a dead baby. There you go. (laughs) And, like, he says that to me in front of my husband. And we're like, are you fucking kidding me right now? Are you literally telling me that I'm going to kill my baby because I don't want to get cut open because you have to get to your daughter's birthday party? Um, So, yeah, I'm, like, crying. I am looking at my husband saying they're going to cut me open and they're going to take our kiddo and they're going to force us to feel like crappy parents for not vaccinating him and for not circumcising him and for not doing all these things that they think we need to do. And they're going to put us in a list and it's, this is the beginning. Like this is, this is how it all begins for people. And I'm like just trapped in this fucking God awful place with these people that don't care about me who would literally let me die because they just don't care. They're like, they just want us to not be there. I, I'm like, how is this the system? How is this our birth system? Mm-hmm. Um, I also should let you know that I'm a, I'm a postpartum doula. So mm-hmm. I'm trained as a doula and I have worked in birth for many years. And uh, it's just like the level of disrespect that they have for the mother and the family is insane. And it wasn't about Vito. He wasn't in distress. It wasn't an emergency. Um, so then when they finally decided that that was my, that was my way of giving birth, they started doing all their things. They had the anesthesiologists come in and they did all their things. And I, what was it? I had been in labor for three days. So my sodium levels were really low because I was throwing up. I was pooping. I was very depleted. And so they were like, well, your sodium levels are really low. You might have diabetes. I'm like, I don't have diabetes. I'm a perfectly healthy 33-year-old woman. 
I am like not obese. I am not like, don't have diabetes. I don't have anything wrong with me. I don't have high blood pressure. I'm not like, why are you trying to diagnose me with all these things that you think I have just so you can give me more drugs to like make my life more <laughs> fragile at this state that I'm in. It's so gnarly. And so they were like, we're going to give you this stuff to like balance out your sodium levels. And I'm like, please don't give me any of that. And then sure enough, like my sister, so my sister, she's a badass. She lives a couple hours away. She came as soon as I got to the hospital and like was my advocate for me. She's had all her babies at home and is like totally my advocate. And she was like, I saw that doctor like slip something into your IV just now and like not tell you. It's just like so snaky. Everything about that hospital is so snaky. They were so creepy about what they did. And so then I'm laying on the operating ta table about to get cut open and I feel like I'm dying. Like I feel completely like I'm dying, like an outer body experience. And the guy was like, just so you know, like you might have a seizure on the table because your sodium levels are so low. So we're here for you if you have a seizure. <laughs> I'm like, cool. <laughs> Glad to know that this is where I am right now. Um, my hot, they wouldn't let me do anything that I wanted to do. I was like, okay, if I'm getting a C-section, then I would like you to let the pulse, the cord pulse a little bit. Cause that's mm -hmm. something you can do. And I would like to hold my baby right away. I would like to be skin to skin with him immediately. And I'm going to breastfeed. So I want to be right with him right away. And they like, wouldn't let me do any of that. Mm. They wouldn't let me go to skin to skin with him until three hours later. So they, they cut me open. They took him out. He was sunny side up, mm. which makes some sense. That explains some things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he was eight, 12. So he was a big boy, mm -hmm. but not too big and like I'm perfectly I'm not so small that I couldn't have birthed my baby you know like he was fine we were fine perfectly compatible and um he was like twisted up a little bit but not bad he was fine he I think I could have had him I think it just was you know the combination of things that happened the way they yeah. did but um and then they gave him to my husband right away and so Mike got to be skin to skin with him right away okay. which was, was good yeah. And then he was perfectly healthy. We he didn't need to be taken away or anything. So that was good. We got to see him right away and got to be with him right away. He breastfed right away and all that good stuff. Um of course they were like not happy with our choices to not give him all the things. Um but whatever. They didn't force us to give him anything and I I don't believe that he got sneakily given anything hopefully. Mhm. Mm um and then we went into the, eventually I like went into recovery, you know, and got to hold my baby and I was with him the whole time and, and didn't let him out of my sight more or less. They took him away one time because his temperature was a degree low. And I was like, then give him to me and I'll put him on my chest and it's going to be okay. Yeah. And they were like, no, we have to bring him to the warmer. <laughs> right. And so then our bill comes and it's like, they charged us a thousand dollars for him to go to the warmer. So that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and then during all the recovery time, there was a lot of creepy stuff happening as well. Like they taped a bag to my son's penis so they could collect his urine so they could drug test him. Oh. And this was that without my knowledge. They didn't tell me they were doing this. They didn't tell me that. And so when I asked about it, I said, why is there a bag on my kid's penis? They were like, oh, we're doing it so we can make sure his sodium levels are normal because yours were so out of whack. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. Take this off right now. I did not consent to this. You are not allowed to just like put stuff on my child's body without me knowing like this is not okay. I don't know who's telling you to do this, but you need to remove it right away. Like not okay. And so they did. They And they didn't say anything about it. They knew they were in the wrong and they like backed up real quick because they knew that I was catching on to all their sneaky stuff. They drug test me. They took all these extra tests that I didn't need. It was just like, and I didn't, I mean, I obviously didn't have any drugs in my system. So it was like, why are you guys treating me? Like, I don't know. It was just really crazy. The whole time I felt constantly like treated like I was this criminal. <laughs> mm. And I'm like, I'm just trying to come here and like have my baby and a in a way that I couldn't at home and like you should be respectful of that and you're not and it's like 
whether or not you agree with home birth, you should honor the person that's in your care. Like that's part of your creed as a doctor. Like you take an oath to treat people respectable and like, well, like you're, that's your job. You're a doctor, you know, like you have to take care of people and they just, they were awful. It was shocking how bad it was. And so then we leave, we get to leave a day early, thank God, because we, we like did all the things and I like showed all the, all the pee and all this stuff. And I like was really on top of everything. And meanwhile, I was taking all these herbs and like, like cow liver, like, so I was like healing really well. And like, <laughs> they were like, wow, you're so healthy. And blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, it's crazy what you can do. when you like, take care of yourself, you know? And, um, we had like social workers come into our room and talk to us like we were idiots. They were like, do you guys have a car seat? Do you guys have a proper bed for your baby at home? Do you guys, do you guys know, like treating us like we like, we're like, I'm like, what is this? And I get it. Like they're doing their jobs and I'm grateful that there's people in the system that are making sure that babies have proper homes to return to. But like, it was just like this complete disregard for the people that are in their care like they weren't treating us appropriately for who we were as people and I mean I guess they didn't know who we were as people but like they could have figured that out really quickly they could have taken some time to know who they're dealing with and not been so rude and like tone deaf to the to the environment that they're part of you know and it was just kind of it was just crazy we had social workers calling us when we got home telling us they were going to come do home visits. Ugh. So like my first month of postpartum, I was just like stressed out that someone was going to come take my baby away. Cause mm. that's what I thought. Like I thought that people were going to come take my baby away. Cause I didn't vaccinate him or because I had a home, like tried to have a home birth. And um, on top of all that, our, we had a bill sent to us and it was for $40,000 or no more than that. It was $40,000 for me and $20,000 for veto. <laughs> so it was just, just insane. So, you know, our, we like had, we got sent to collections. We paid, we paid what we could and they wouldn't work with us. They were very unable to help us in that area too. We tried everything we tried. We even got a lawyer because we were like, this isn't okay. Like you're charging us for all this stuff that we didn't consent to. And I guess, I mean, I guess we did consent to it because we signed papers when we walked in, right. but it's just a snaky, terrible system. And that doctor doesn't deserve, I can't like what he said to me and how he treated me is just not okay. Like he needs to be accountable for the way he treats people. And he's not like, if I was to go complain about that, it would just get swept under the rug and he would get a gold star by his name for whatever. He doesn't get, he has no accountability for his actions and people get away with treating people terribly. I mean, it's happening right now, as you can probably see in America, like people are getting away with murdering people all the time and it happens in maternity care all the time. And no one gets, no one ever no one ever gets held accountable for it. And it's just kind of crazy that that's the system that we live in, yet we are supposed to have like the best medical care in the world. It's like, no, I don't think we do. <laughs> well, as far as, as far as um, maternity care worldwide, women are treated like crap everywhere. Oh, for sure. Everywhere. And so, I mean, it isn't, I mean, it changes from place to place. Like not everywhere is going to get a bill for $60,000. Right. But the general tone, like you either agree with me or your baby's going to die. Yeah. That's pretty much the tone everywhere. Oh, for sure. So um, do you think that the way that, how, how would you, if, if you have another child, how, how, what choices would you make? So I've thought a lot about that. Vito is 18 months old and I don't know if we'll have more kids, not at this point anyway, but um, my good friend, a good friend of mine had a similar situation to mine and she's having another baby and she's choosing to have another C-section, which I've definitely thought about that because I don't know, there's part of me that wants to have a home birth again, obviously, because that's mm -hmm. what I want to do and I mm -hmm. want to have that control and also just like be at home and be in the water and it's yeah. safe and comfortable, but there's 
also wants to recreate the C-section experience in a really gentle, beautiful way and like, you know, have a really good OB and a midwife that want to bring that really open, gentle cesarean experience with me where I can like watch what's going on and hold my baby and be part of the experience and feel in control and also very safe versus mm -hmm. the way that I felt during yeah. the one that I had last time. So, um, I don't know. Yeah. I have no idea what I would, what I would pick in that way. I don't know if I would have, I don't know. I don't know if I'd have another home birth just because I think I have a lot of, a lot of anxiety around it yeah. because of what happened, but it's hard to see because I think every birth is so different for every woman. And yeah. I think that it could just like go really smoothly. I don't think it was anything to do with my body. And I don't think it's, I don't think I'm like broken, you know, like I think that I'm capable of having a vaginal birth. I just think yeah. that he was tangled up and I was, you know, my body was tight or who knows? I don't know. We don't know. Who knows? And the fact is you can't even tell because you were treated so badly. You cannot yeah. tell if you had been treated with love and care and attention right. when you got to the hospital. Things I could have opened right different. up. I know. It's true. It's very so true. What would you say is the main, like, the birth was traumatic for you, clearly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I still get thing? really triggered by it. Of course. Yeah. Of course. I mean, the oldest woman that I have on my list right now, who I'm interviewing, is 73. We don't wow. forget our birth experiences. No. Um, but what do you think is the key to avoid, like, what do you think traumatized you the most? Um, I think that what that man said to me was traumatizing in the way, and the disregard for my life, <laughs> like, they, like, they just didn't, hey, buddy, what's up? They had very little, you want more? They had little, very little regard for my life. They kind of just treated me like, well, you might die. Sorry. <laughs> so the whole time I was there, I was fearful for my life. Like I felt like they were going to kill me. <laughs> mm. And I still, I feel like that every time I go to the doctor, I feel like they don't have our best interest at hand. And I think that's really been coming up for me lately too with this whole COVID bullshit. It's like people are going to the hospital and they don't come out because they get killed in the hospital because they're being put on ventilators and not being treated properly and they're dying. And like, that's what's happening here and it's happening everywhere. And like, I just don't trust the system. I don't trust going to the doctor does not feel good to me. It doesn't feel nourishing. It doesn't feel like they're going to help me. It feels like they're going to put poison in my body and potentially kill me. So mm -hmm. I think that was the trauma lies from really being laying on the table, being tied up and cut open. Like, ugh, like that was, and not being able to hold my baby right away. Like that was the most traumatizing thing for me mm -hmm. because it felt like I was under, I felt like I was being cut open by aliens. <laughs> It's terrible. Yeah. And like being held down and drugged, like you can't, it's, it's like being like, it's equivalent to feeling like you're being drugged and raped. Like it's like that, it feels violating. Like they're not taking care of you, you know? And ugh, it's just like a, it's just a rotten feeling. So yeah. Like with well, people's hands in your body, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I really want to thank you for sharing your story, and I'm sorry if it's opened up stuff that maybe you're kind of starting to cover a little. It's okay, yeah. I mean, it's good for me to talk about it, and it's good for me to let it out and be part of it, you know? <laughs>